Hey, what's up guys? Alex Espinoza with the Ricky Henderson of YouTube. Make sure to use the promo code RickyBlog at lastdivebra.com for 10% off. Use the affiliate link down below. Now we got that out the way, let's just jump into some A's news. Hope you guys had a great Memorial Day weekend. Long weekend, a lot of news happened. And, it, and, and not so much news, but it was a lot of interesting uh, discussion on A's, in the A's Twitter sphere the uh, the past few days regarding their future in Sacramento and Las Vegas and everything. All right, so I want to start off with this Reddit post that got a lot of traction over the weekend from a Reddit user called It's All About Satellites. It was posted on the Major League Baseball Reddit page, but it um, was also brought up uh, somehow in the Ace Twitter sphere and it got a lot of traction on there the past few days. And there was some pushback on the information in there, so I just kind of wanted to go through and clarify it's kind of the talking points and where it seems like the initial information was wrong, but what I also learned about this. So, um, so Senate Bill 1, um, you know, requires a d development agreement for, for the A's ballpark in Las Vegas. It requires a development agreement which lays out the financing plan, um, you know, clear cut where the A's are getting the money from and everything like that. So um, the Las Vegas Stadium Authority just held a meeting a couple of weeks ago. And Steve Hill, who is the chairman of that stadium, Las Vegas Stadium Authority, said that the A's are pretty likely to present the development, uh, you know, at least a, a draft of the development agreement in July when the authority is scheduled to meet again in a couple of months. So the biggest thing is the A's are still trying to secure financing um, for this. Uh, for this project, and they're still touting it as a $1.5 billion project, which I'll also get into later. There's a lot of levels to this thing. And as Jeremy Koo noted, he's a former writer for Athletics Nation and a lawyer, and he's been really good at parsing out this information. Um, it, the Reddit user was actually wrong in saying that the A's are seeking a good credit score, uh, credit investment rating. It's actually the, uh, the lender, not the borrower, who needs to have a BB. Uh, triple B plus rating, so that's either SMP or Moody's. You know, supposedly they went to Goldman Sachs earlier and were not able to uh, secure financing. So, you know, the A's are going to other banks to try to secure, or other, you know, lending partners to see if they can find, um, you know, some money for this, for this project because they're going to need it, you know? I mean, uh, 1.5 billion is what it's costing now, but as Dee noted earlier, it, the cost overruns could go 20% higher, which could actually put the real price tag at 1.8. So on the next section of the, the Reddit post, the writer goes to lay out where John Fisher's money is, and there's also some uh, issues here as well, because and Forbes actually has the A's valued at 1.2 billion instead of 1.4 billion. The 500 million is, is correct. Minority ownership stakes, he does own some European soccer teams, I believe, so there's probably a little bit of money in there. And but the biggest issue here is the 2.7 million share, 2.8 million shares of Gap stock that he, that the original poster uh, wrote, and it's actually according to Todd Saren, who's the you know the treasurer of the Oakland 68s, who looked at some SEC filings. It's actually Fisher owns actually 90 million shares of Gap stock, uh, 50 million of which he can actually you know trade on his own. So that's about and you know the stock's trading at about 21 dollars. So. That's about uh, you know one and one billion and change that he has in Gap stock that he could up and sell tomorrow. Who knows? That would probably absolutely tank the the stock price. But let's just say you know he has a, a billion dollars in liquid stock there, and about a um, hundred five million in this Coliseum lot is is what the original poster's hearing. But Casey Pratt was hearing it's actually down to it's actually up closer to one hundred twenty five million, which I think makes sense um, even though the that uh, you know, the county recently sold its half of its share last week to AASEG, the African American Sports and Entertainment Group, for 105 million. And you would think that's the market rate. It sounded like last September the A's turned down 115 million dollars for re reportedly for their half of this um, um, to an AASEG offer. So um, the A's, of course, recently finished their 85 million dollar purchase. So they own half of the Coliseum site for now. But there is a lawsuit challenging that. But for now, the A's, you know, sitting on an asset worth about $125 million is what Casey Pratt is hearing. So that's how much the A's, um, you know, have right now. And, and so the money is a little bit different than, than what we're here. Um, and also, yes, it, it, um, he is a real estate. He is a partner in Sansom Partners, a co-founder of that uh, company, I believe. And so, yeah, he... 
According to Forbes, he's uh, uh, Fisher's worth about $2.9 billion, but a lot of that money is you know, tied up in the A's, tied up in the earthquakes, or tied up in his gap stock. That's where it seems like the majority of his money is coming from. So it's not like you know he's going to have to, at some point it sounds like he's going to have to rob Peter to pay Paul in order to, to, to make this thing happen if he does want to make it happen. But honestly, I thought the most interesting thing that came out about this whole discussion was that Casey Pratt was reporting that the A's are keeping their TV deal. So I was, you know, throughout this whole process, I was really under the impression that the A's would have to, you know, sell or they would, you know, lose a big chunk of their TV revenue by moving up to Sacramento. But, um, you know, it's the same same DMA, the designated marketing area is is. is in Sacramento and the A's is the same thing. You know, NBC Sports California, they carry the Kings. Um, but, you know, it's it's not like, you know, say you live in Palo Alto and you used to be able to watch the A's in Oakland. Now that they're in Sacramento, you're not going to be able to. You know, the, the, the A's signal with NBC Sports is reaching the same amount of households in the same area. It's just that the location has changed. So, so that's why, um, you know, Yahoo Sports reported that... Um, that the A's and NBC uh, had to, or actually it was uh, Sportico reported that the A's and NBC had to rework their their deal to make it happen. Uh, but I, I talked to another source who said that maybe there were some small changes, but as as far as they know, that this uh, that the the deal that the A's have in Sacramento really hasn't changed much. So looking at maybe like 67, 70 million dollars is what has been reported that the deal is worth. And I believe it goes through until about 2030, so like the, the next few years. So as long as the A's are supposed to be in Northern California, I believe they're going to be staying on the same TV deal. Um, but also another interesting thing I heard, um, f- you know, from somebody who's in the industry is that the, the A's are having a really tough time at securing TV sponsorships. Like NBC, they, you know, they get sponsorship money, you know, for, for companies that want to work with the Giants. And then NBC has offered, uh, you know, hey, do you want to put your, your sponsorship literally for free on the A's and companies are like, no, so they don't want to associate with the A's. So, hey, maybe that's a win for the A's fans is that <laughs> their A's sponsorship money is probably not where it should be for them being a major league franchise. And, you know, there's so much negative press around the A's that, you know, companies are probably scared to jump on board with them. And that's what it sounds like. Um, NBC is having problems with that, you know, securing sponsorship with, with uh, the A's this year. So... That's one thing that's happening. In the end, this uh, this Reddit post wasn't uh, completely accurate, but it kind of you know brought some attention up to this issue, which I thought was cool, and I learned more about this the TV deal thing. So, so you know, and then if you also consider that the A's are making an estimated forty five million dollars in um, in revenue sharing, I mean, that's one hundred fifty million dollars that the A's had to play with. Just, just to start with, without even doing anything, you know. So even if they do have some some big losses, and I think their payroll's around sixty million this year, they you know still have fifty five million dollar to deal with with losses. So there was also another big uh, social media post that kind of took off this weekend from Brian Cantrell, who is uh, <laughs> as Neil DeMoss described him, he is a tech exec, tech exec, and Oakland A's fan. So I like that he's a um, he's the co-founder of a computer server company called Oxide, and uh, I, you might have heard his name. He had an, another really thoughtful thread about the A's and the whole situation recently, but this one came out a couple days ago, and it started with a he retweeted a thought from Melissa Lockard, a writer for the Athletic, and she proposed that you know everything is so illogical about this situation that. But maybe maybe this whole situation is heading towards contraction because it's such a headache and it seems like the days are just going into dead end after dead end. But, uh, you know, as Neil DeMoss of uh, Field of Schemes wrote, he said that would be tough because it would require, uh, you know, union sign off for the players union. You know, it would be 30, you know, 30 less jobs at the big league level or excuse me, like 26 less jobs at the big league level. It would be crazy expensive for the league. And it would open the door to antitrust suits and everything like in et cetera. So not to mention there would only be 29 teams unless they're going to do two contractions, take the Rays out of there. But <laughs> I don't think the union would sign off on two teams getting contracted, you know. So, but then again, nothing makes sense. But um, I, I did like this th- uh, thread from Brian because he, in pretty much every point he made, he had sources of, you know, where he was basing his logic and where he was you know, making his, uh, like why he was making his points and where he was getting his information from. So I really like that. Um, 
So the biggest thing is, of course, where Fisher is going to get the, pub, uh, the, the funding for this stadium. So they're still calling it a $1.5 billion stadium, again. Um, but as D, uh, D was hearing, his cost overruns could put it at 20%, which is like $1.8 billion. And another thing I think is getting completely swept under the rug about this is that when the A's initially proposed this um, project, it was a $1.5 billion, 30,000-seat stadium. But now it's a 33,000-seat stadium, um, so about you know 10% bigger, so 3,000 more seats, but it still has the same price tag. Uh, as far as I know, it still has the same acreage. So they're just going to add 10,000 seats in there for free, and it's not going to... They'll just work it into the budget. I mean, I don't... There's a lot of things here that just kind of don't really make a lot of sense. Like, oh, okay, so now it's 33,000 seats. But, of course, that um, was kind of to quell those absurd attendance projections uh, that they're making with Jeremy Aguero. So we'll get into that. A lot of numbers here. Bear with me here. A lot of numbers here I'm about to throw at you. So, um, so of course, SB1 was approved by Nevada legislators last year which gives the A's up to $300 million in public money, including $120 million in Clark County bonds, which will be voted on in 2025. So $380 million in public funds. And say that, um, you know, there is cost overruns, and it is 20% of the projected 1.5, that's $300 million right there. Um, so maybe this just, that 300, the public fund money will just cover the cost of overruns and then have another $80 million to throw out the project. So let's, I, just for the exercise's purpose, I'm gonna go here and say um, that it's the total price is 1.8 billion, right? So you take off the 380 million, you're still left with 1.42 billion that John Fisher is supposedly looking for. Um, and back in March, Fisher issued, Fisher and the A's issued some conflicting comments. Um, initially on March 5th, he told Slusser that, uh, Fisher told Slusser, uh, you know, during that, in that article where he was looking wistfully out into the Bay Area, <laughs> um, that he was looking for $500 million in investments. And then a couple days later, the aides clarified it and said, oh no, they, they would, I mean, they would, they would love to have $500 million, but if it doesn't happen, that the Fisher family is committed to spend up to $1 billion. And, you know, just looking at this now, if we're looking at a, uh, a, a realistic $1.8 billion price tag. But, you know, both things could be true. You know, the Fisher family could um, spend, you know, close to $900 million of their own money and they would still need $500 million from outside investing to hit that $1.4 billion uh, price tag uh, if it gets to $380 million, you know? So once again, uh, the A's are valued at $1.2 billion. He has about a billion dollars in liquid gap shares 500 million from the quakes, about 125 million, let's say, for the Coliseum site, um, and you know, so Forbes that puts puts him right near that 2.9 billion dollar mark that Forbes put his net worth. He also has the Mendocino Redwood Company, and and who knows, Sansom Partners. I mean, there's so yeah, let's let's say you know he he's worth that three billion dollars, but again, it's not like he's made a big sale lately and is just sitting on a lump of cash or something like that. Like all of his stuff is tied up in. Um, and these other things. So as we get through Cantrell's thread here, he noted that debt and equity are two ways to to make this thing happen for for Fisher to get his money. So first, let's start off with like you know, so debt, you know, that would be him getting a loan and paying it off with interest over the next you know whatever thirty years or however long it takes for them to do it, or maybe shorter, you know. So um, the problem with the numbers that the A's are presenting is that they're not, uh, they weren't really in reality. You know, when Jeremy Aguero was up there, you know, presenting these numbers, they, they were projecting 2.4 million additional, you know, fans or visitors basically to this facility a year. And if the A's have 80 home dates, you do the math, 81 home dates, so that's a sellout every year for, every game, every year for 30 years, just to hit, the projections that they were doing to pay off these Clark County bonds, the $380 million in public funding. So, of course, since everybody crunched the numbers on that, um, as Brody Brazil, I mean, Jeremy Aguero at the time, he was saying, oh, I'm not gonna like light, we're, they aren't, don't have to light the world on fire to hit 30,000 um, 
a night, which is just an average MLB crowd. Well, <laughs> if your stadium is you know, capped at 30,000, it's a little different. You know, if uh, if there was that much demand, wouldn't they just have a bigger stadium? You know, why wouldn't they? Why would they cap themselves at thirty thousand if the demand isn't bigger than that? It doesn't make any sense. So, um, so the Mariners. So as Brody Brazil noted, um, you know, the Mariners in twenty twenty two they ranked fifteenth in MLB attendance, right around thirty k, and they have a stadium with about forty seven thousand, forty eight thousand seats. So lenders might be a little standoffish about this data because the A's would have to sell out, you know, sell thirty thousand tickets every all eighty one games for for thirty years, and even with a thirty three thousand seat stadium, that seems pretty ambitious. Because uh, if you look at this graphic from Brody Brazil, that most of these teams in the middle range of 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 you know seats being sold, um, it's you know between fifty and seventy percent. So you know that's between what like fifteen and uh, what is that, like 20, 21,000 fans or thereabouts, uh, which seems more realistic if you have a 30,000-seat stadium. But, of course, the A's are projecting way more than that. And eventually, if the, the funds do run out, the general fund, the Clark County General Fund could be tapped to, um, I mean, I think there's some reserves and stuff like that, but eventually, you know, the Clark County General Fund, which is used just to do everything, pay for roads, schools, whatever, whatever, could eventually get tapped to pay for this. So, you know, I don't, I don't think Jeremy Aguero and what the A's were pushing out there makes, you know, really lives in reality. So that's the biggest thing about these these um, these projections that they're doing to pay back these loans. It's been about 13 months since the A's initially announced their binding land deal in Las Vegas at the Wild Wild West side, and then of course they switched over to the Tropicana a few weeks later. But, you know, they're still looking for financing for this project. And initially, I believe there were reports that the A's were talking with Goldman Sachs, but clearly Goldman Sachs wasn't on board, so now they're looking elsewhere. And then, you know, the LA Times reported that they, they have hired a group called the Galoshioto Partners, uh, sports partners, to help them broker a deal to find $500 million in investing. So they, they're looking for outside help to get them the money for this thing to get it done, which has been done before. But uh, I, I really thought this tweet was in, um, in during Brian's thread was important. He, he quote tweeted a, a Twitter user, RCN3, who said that one of the financial truisms at play here is that if you're buying, if you're buying minority interests, you're buying management. Nobody is going to buy Fisher and his team. That is fundamentally why his capital raising scheme will fail and he'll have to sell the athletics. So, um, so yeah, as you know, we've heard that Fisher has actually been trying to sell minority stake in in the A's, but the rumblings is that he is the A's and him and the A's are valuing the franchise at two billion dollars already. You know, which is maybe where they're headed after a new stadium, um, if it is you know completed. If they had a new stadium, fresh new digs in Las Vegas, yeah, maybe they're worth two billion dollars. But as of right now, they're the Oakland Athletics getting. You know, getting the boot out of Oakland, getting run out of town by their own fans, worth $1.2 billion. And that's the reality here, you know? So, um, you know, the issue if you're a, just imagine, like, say say you're a guy with $200 million, right? You're like, hey, John, I want to, um, I want to buy, you know, a, a stake in your team for $200 billion. I'm looking at Forbes right now at their website. It's worth... Six, so that would be 16.7% of your team, you know, one-sixth of your team. And John goes, no, 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 we're worth $2 billion, dude. Uh, you'll just get 10%. But, but yeah, I'll take your $200 million. Um, but it's just worth 10% instead of, you know, 16.7%. So um, nobody in their right mind would do that because they're banking on the value of the franchise to increase once they put their money into the team, which would you know, spark this, hopefully get them get the stadium, which would improve the franchise valuation. But if you're putting down your money at the rate that the A's are projecting, you know, there's no room for you to grow and capitalize, you know, make, make any money as an investor. So I don't know if Fisher thinks that he's like a stern negotiator or something, but it just seems like stupid business practice to me. So unless he's just out there fishing for a big dumb whale, you know, I don't know who's going to do that. I mean, if if you're a billionaire and you have that much money, you probably think you'd be smart enough to stay away from a deal like that. Like, I, 
you know, I'm not a financial guy. I don't know anything about money or whatever, but that just seems like a bad deal to me. You know, why would you put down, why would you invest in something at a future valuation as opposed to what it's worth now? It doesn't make any sense to me. So, um, you know, and there's no guarantee the A's even reached that $2 billion threshold, you know, that uh, supposedly, you know, reported, uh, you know, the Orioles were just sold for 1.725 billion, and which is right near their 2023 valuation from Forbes. So, uh, I don't. I mean, if the A's do get this new stadium, I you know, jumping from eight from 1.2 to two billion seems like a pretty big leap here. You know, and you know the Orioles are a storied franchise who have a great ballpark, and they're worth 1.7. So, even if the A's get the do, even if the A's get the Ar armadillo dome um, on the strip. Uh, I don't see how it pushes their value up to two billion dollars just like that. So, yeah, it doesn't really make uh, any sense to me. And um, another wrinkle to this that Brian brought up. Oh, there's more to this thread. This is a big thread. We're just getting. Uh, we're not just getting started, but we're like in the middle of this thing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> another wrinkle that he brought up is the flip tax, which was first reported by Bob Nightingale of USA Today. So um, basically, if Fisher, so. So as part of the deal of the A's of the other 29 owners unanimously unanimously approving this A's deal to Las Vegas is they waived the 300 million dollar upfront relocation fee, but they they impose this um, a stipulation called the flip tax. So it basically, if Fisher tries to flip the team anytime in the next 10 years, he will have to pay a tax on that of the purchase, which will be deducted from the total sale and divided amongst the other 29 owners. So from between now and 2028, so the next five years, if Fisher is to sell under these terms, uh, Fisher will be taxed 20%. So at the current valuation of 1.2 billion, that would be $240 million that he would have to give up. So, you know, he's looking at 80%, you know, already he's kind of hamstringing himself, right? And then in 2029, that figure goes down to 10%, and then incrementally down until eventually 2034, where he'll be tax-free. So the next 10 years, if Fisher wants to get the full price of his sale, um, he or he can't basically he can't sell the team unless he wants to get if he wants to get full price. It would have to be at a discount to him and go to other owners. But uh, you know, at this point, he already saved himself 300 million, so maybe he'll look at that as a dub. But he's kind of, you know, strung himself out. You know, he kind of hamstrung himself in the future, uh, you know, to take the upfront, to bite the bullet, uh, you know, to get the savings up front, you know? So, um, so again, uh, let's just recap all the free money we talked about on a previous Ricky report. But, I mean, just all this free money that Fisher is getting, you know? Um, so the $300 million in the re relocation fee, uh, $380 million in public, money from Nevada and about 180 million in free rent from GLPI. So that's 860 million dollars in free money and then this dude's still looking for investors and still looking for help. Okay? Just put that just just remember. Just remember all that. And um, but it's funny, you know, Steve Hill recently sent a pretty dismissive about this whole thing and he said it's pretty likely that the A's will have a draft development agreement by Ju uh, by July. Excuse me. So um, we'll see what happens in the next two months, but you know the, Trop the, the Tropicana Hotel is already being demolished, and if the A's want to get this thing up by 2028, like they're saying, they got to start construction by next year probably. So, looks like a pretty tight deadline to see if the A's will make this thing happen. I mean, just to recap all this stuff that's going on, I mean, so the A's reportedly have, you know, not been able to attract, uh, you know, Goldman Sachs get their confidence or find other lenders. Um, they're having trouble finding private investors. They're about to move their product out of Oakland because they burned so many bridges here that they have to leave. They can't stay at the Coliseum anymore, so they're going to a 10,000-seat stadium, a 14,000-seat with standing room only, um, which you know severely caps their revenue. The minor league facility also needs upgrades, uh, which is another thing we're going to talk about. I'll get here in a second. Um, and they're supposed to be competitive by 2028. Like, I don't... I don't really see it happening, you know? And what if attendance kind of starts, you know, is not great, you know? I mean, I think the A's are kind of banking on that there's going to be this huge fervor and, you know, they'd be able to sell out those 10,000 seats or 14,000 seats easily. But, um, you know, they only have 65,000, 6,500 fans of game right now. And, 
you know, they're going to be competing against the River Cats, uh, which is funny too. I mean, people already have season tickets there. I mean, there are people already committed financially to going to River Cats games, perhaps, and they're big Giants fans. I mean, maybe they'll go to some A's games here and there, but I mean, people are already invested in a baseball team up there too. So it's. Uh, I just don't see how they're going to be competitive by 2028 when they're supposed to open Las Vegas. If anything, I think things are going to go downhill for them. So, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think Vivek honestly is just waiting that Fisher just fumbles this whole thing and he makes sense, you know, as the guy who would pick it up, you know, Fisher could sell it, his, his franchise, just get out of there, give it to Vivek. Vivek could maybe redevelop Sutter Health Park, put a new ballpark there or something like that. And, yeah, maybe the 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 A's stay in Sacramento long term. Who knows? But uh, it just seems like this Las Vegas deal. There's a lot of dots that need to be connected, and soon um, to make this thing a reality, especially by 2028. So who knows? Eventually, they might turn into a lame duck franchise, and Fisher will have to sell, and Vivek would. I would assume Vivek would be the guy. You know, if he's already kind of in there, and you can maybe help this franchise land on its feet in Sacramento. Who knows? Uh, maybe Fisher selling the team would revitalize it like the, the Washington football team did when Daniel Snyder sold the team. And it would just completely change the situation, you know? And, hey, Fisher's name's already tarnished. He might as well get a billion dollars out of it and sell the team, right? <laughs> but, um, yeah, who knows? I mean, I, I just think that, you know, either... I mean, one one thing is maybe what if he sells the earthquakes, you know? What if he sells the earthquakes to keep the A's afloat? You know, I, I don't think it makes financial sense. I think MLS is about to boom. Um, I think if he holds on to the earthquakes another 10, 20 years, that thing's only going to go up uh, from his $500 million uh, valuation. So maybe that's the team that he's going to sell to keep uh, to make this stadium happen. But uh, but otherwise, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. I mean, it sounds like he's having trouble finding outside investors in his products. So um, if, he had, if, if Fisher eventually does have to sell the A's, I think that would be a huge dub um, for the A's fans. I think they would be really happy with that, knowing that you know them fighting against him and all the sell movement worked. But uh, you know, he's then Fisher would be a billion dollars richer. He probably wouldn't care. And who knows? Maybe Vivek will be the guy to to, to buy it from from Fisher and keep him in Sacramento. But hey, who knows? Maybe even Salt Lake City will get in the mix. You know, they got pro team fever right now. So. Um, a lot of moving parts to this, as there always is, but uh, I just want to thank Brian for <laughs> kind of bringing us down all these different uh, elements and parts to this deal and why this, this Las Vegas Fisher thing just kind of looks a little murkier and murkier by the day. And every day that goes by, they get a little bit closer to the, you know, um, the next stadium authority meeting and, you know, possible start date for construction and, and at the Tropicana lot. So, so many things here, and yeah, who knows? This is just a big Pandora's box, <laughs> and I don't even think the A's know where it's headed. Nobody knows. And as I talked about earlier, Sports Business Journal and The Athletic, um, you know, relayed some comments from Rob Manfred regarding this, the, the updates that have been coming at Sutter Health Park, which of course is a AAA ballpark for the, the Sacramento River Cats currently. And Manfred indicated that the A's are constructing a separate adjoining uh, building to Sutter Health Park in Sacramento that will serve as a home club serve as a home clubhouse, and the visitors clubhouse will be renovated. The stadium will reserve new artificial turf and some other upgrades such as club seating, video boards, and camera quality to ensure its readiness. So that's from the Sports Business Journal, who reported that, and also. Um, I don't, I mean, that's a whole other thing. It's like, how does the player, I don't know, I haven't heard from the players union, but uh, where do they stand in all this? Because, like, yeah, as it stands right now, the clubhouses are out in center field, and, you know, they're definitely not big league quality, so the A's are going to supposedly build a new one um, for them. But what about the visitors? You know, where are the Yankees going to be? Where are the Dodgers going to be? Um, are they going to be in those clubhouses that are out in center field? Uh, because I was talking to Melissa Lockhart of The Athletic about this, and she, she visited the facilities so they did some renovations um, earlier this year, and she visited the facilities, and what she heard was that the, the visitor clubhouse renovation, they, they took the old um, lockers from the home clubhouse and put them in the visitor's clubhouse. So, yeah, that's an upgrade, but it's also like, dude, 
you know, it's just, <laughs> you know, the, so the Yankees are going to use the Rivercats old lockers, and that's going to be okay. So, no, I mean, so they're going to do upgrades at the visitor team locker as well. But um, I wonder if it's going to be out in center field still, or if they're going to have to put it closer to the dugout, because, you know, players like to go back and forth uh, in between games and stuff like that. It's a different, different game than when they built that stadium, <laughs> you know? And... Um, yeah, I've been in those. I mean, I, I've been in those clubhouses once. It was like back in 2010. I was doing a story on Chris Carter and Michael Taylor. Uh, there were some hot ace prospects at the time, and I just remember it was just this big open room, um, just with some tables, um, super basic. I mean, this is 13 years ago, so I'm sure that they it looks way different now. But yeah, it was just just a big open room, nothing crazy, and. Um, and I remember just Josh Donaldson was staring at me because like, what are you doing? Like, what are you? I was like, oh, I'll wait for Chris Carter. But that was, that was my, my Josh Donaldson story. That was before he even made it to the bigs. So little did I know, an MVP was grilling me. Just 23-year-old Alex, intern. Oh. <laughs> Another big thing is artificial turf in 100-degree heat. Like, god damn, that's going to be super hot. And yeah, uh, I guess Manfred confirmed that. It's going to be artificial turf with the Athletic. And the ABC 10 up in Sacramento also confirmed these changes with the A's. So, I mean... They're only averaging about 6,500 fans a year, uh, a game right now, which is their lowest since the 70s. In 1977, they averaged about 6,100. And in 1979, they averaged only less than 4,000. It was about 3,700 fans, 3,800 fans a game. So their third worst crowds in Oakland A's history could be the second worst by the end of the year if it keeps getting smaller like this. Um, but, you know, if they're going to a smaller facility, so they're already used, they could fit their whole crowds into a smaller facility anyway, so... In some messed up way, I feel like going to Sacramento could save the A's money because they would just have to have a smaller game day staff, just a smaller event venue and everything like that. And maybe this is just them cost cutting, you know? They just got one one set of <laughs> vendors to, you know, and concessions to worry about instead of two or three and all that stuff. I mean, I like Coliseum vendings open anyways. So, anyways, uh, who knows if... Uh, <clears throat> So in some messed up way, I feel like moving to Sacramento, somehow I'm going to save Fisher some more money. <laughs> hey, put free rent, more handouts for John Fisher up in Sacramento. Thanks, Vivek. I know it's a super long Ricky report, but we got some <laughs> baseball news as well. The A's lost two out of three from Houston over this weekend and made a bunch of, of uh, transactions over the past couple days as well. And another starter is out on the injured list as Ross Stripling has been placed on the injured list with a right elbow strain. And now four out of the five dudes in the opening day rotation are hurt. Uh, Paul Blackman with a foot injury, Alex Wood with a shoulder injury, Joe Boyle with a back injury, now Stripling. And Ken Waldachuk also is lost for the year with Tommy John surgery. So that just leaves J.P. Sears as the only guy left from the opening day rotation who's still there. And so right now they got J.P. Sears, Joey Estes, Aaron Brooks. They have Mitch Spence as an emergency starter. I mean, total, total patchwork, you know. And they recently brought on a 24-year-old Aussie Southpaw named Jack O'Laughlin, uh, who's a candidate to get starts. And he made his debut on Sunday. He got some. He got three innings of work. And another part of this thing is Brandon Belak, a right-hander. He was designated for assignment. Uh, he was a guy who was a candidate, but he was putting up some pretty ugly. He was looking really hittable with the A's. I don't know if they even would. I mean, at this point, they're pretty desperate. They probably just bring him back just to eat some innings. They just need. They literally just need people to eat some innings. Um, and I wonder if uh, Kyle Muller will get a you know considered to get back in the rotation because he's he was you know he's been a really good long man pretty pretty solid this year but the A's really just need some innings at this point you know so uh, there's a bunch of other player movement as well uh, earlier today on Tuesday Aledemus Diaz is called up for I mean he's been injured all year uh, but he was called up from AAA after making a rehab assignment in Las Vegas. But he was just 4 for 26. So he's been 154 in 10 games down there. Doesn't give you much confidence that he's figured out the bat after his struggles last year. And to make room for Diaz, the A's DFA Tyler Nevin, who was in the midst of a 1 for 43 slump, which is absolutely brutal. Um, they also called up a right-hander Tyler Ferguson, who's more of a reliever. And outfielder Miguel Andahar, who he had a three-hit game on Friday. So, in order to make room for all these guys, uh, Tyler Nevin has been DFA'd, Brett Harris, third baseman, has been sent to AAA, and it's also worth noting that Jordan Diaz, um, the A's former 
the A's infielder who had three dingers in New York last year, he's cleared waivers and he's now in AAA Las Vegas. So, a whole bunch of A's player movement. But, yeah, Andohar, I'm excited to see him. He, he seemed like he was um, have, he was having a really good spring. Uh, could bring some stability to the A's uh, outfield there, um, along with Rooker. You know, I think uh, having Andohar in there could really solidify, you know, the middle of the lineup. And But the rotation is woo, looking rough, looking really rough. Uh, Letimus Diaz, not really expecting much from him, honestly. Uh, it seems like a hole in the lineup. <laughs> That's what he was last year. and Not great at defense or anything either. So, uh, well, we'll see. But, yeah, Tyler Nevin wasn't doing anything. I think, yeah, that was going to happen. So, And last but not least, got some ballers news. Last time we talked, they were 2-0, and but now they are 2-4. and That means they lost their last four games of their series against the Glacier Range, Glacier Range Riders. But we did get to see Kelsey Whitmore pitch. Uh, she pitched in two games, and she's given up five runs in 3.2 uh, innings, so it's the ERA over 12 right now. But uh, Jason Burke shared this video of her getting a couple of strikeouts. So shout out to Kelsey pitching for the Ballers. That's pretty cool. And as I'm recording this right now, the Ballers are just open their second ever series against the Rocky Mountain Vibes in Colorado Springs. So they're going to play six more games set. And then they'll have an off day next Monday and open their season next Tuesday, June 4th, at Raimondi Park in West Oakland. So, hope to see you all there. I'll definitely be there. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe for more content. I know this one was super long. A lot of different numbers and talking points. If you made it this far, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. All right, see you guys later this week with another Ricky Report.